to have you. Hey, Chris is here. Good to see you, Chris. And everyone online, I wish I could see you, but uh, welcome to you too. This is a holiday weekend. It's Labor Day weekend, and I always think this weekend. Uh, this is the weekend of re rest, right? And this is the day of rest for us as believers. That the Lord from the beginning has said, take a day off once a week. To rest, you need that. Get out of the rat race. And then the best kind of rest is worshiping. It's a strange way of revitalizing you. You might not think it will, but it does. I have some announcements for you here. And what you'll hear in these announcements are really what we're supposed to do. You're going to hear things about prayer, worship, the Bible. These are the things we do that we really do believe are life-giving First of all, on worship, September 11th, that's coming up this Friday in the parking lot, a special uh, worship time uh, led by the Marshes. Music uh, starts at 7.30, but please gather before that at 7 o'clock. Uh, today, there is a prayer meeting. We always do this at the beginning of the school year, and man, we certainly need to do it this school year, as crazy as it is impacting many of you deeply, I realize. Uh, educators prayer meeting online, 1230. You can find the link in the email or on our, our homepage. Uh, join, uh, it's over Zoom. And uh, you don't have to be an educator, but if you care about educators and education, and administration, parents, all that, please join them for prayer. Uh, two more announcements I believe I have here. Uh, one is communion. We're gonna do communion for the second time uh, since COVID hit. And this went well enough last month with the three options we gave 
Number one, here in the sanctuary, we'll be serving communion. And then secondly, shortly after the service, in the parking lot, you could stay in your car uh, driving in here if you feel like that's the safest and best way to take care of your health and your loved one's health. You can stay in the car. Or we have that little enclosed-in area we call the secret garden. Uh, and uh, we serve communion there too. That went well enough that we're going to do it again uh, next week about the exact same way. So September 13th, communion next Sunday. And then finally, uh, oh no, excuse me, a new one in here, Old Church Picnic. We just decided to do this October 4th. So it's about a month away. Uh, save the date. You will hear more. But we thought this would be a great time after everything we've gone through to get the church together in a picnic. I see the Landis's out there. Our church picnic that the Mosers went to in 2002, we met them, and that was a big deal for us staying here at New Life, so it's so appropriate to see them there. Uh, they warmly welcomed us, and that made a big difference. Finally, women's Bible study. Our women have a wonderful Bible study. They put in all kinds of work every year, every lesson, every talk that they give. This year on Ezra and Nehemiah, starting as you can see the first one is Wednesday, the 23rd, but there are other times, Friday and Sunday, and uh, you can see some of the, the uh, items about it, and you can register online. Please think about joining that study. They will teach you the Word of God. Now I would like to invite up John Deaton uh, for a testimony, and we'll see what John has to say. Thank you, John, for sharing with us. All right. Good morning. Um, I wanted to share just a little bit about what God is doing in my life um, and how he has brought me. Uh, I, uh, well, I'll just start from the beginning. Um, so my name is John Deaton. Um, my wife, Deborah, and uh, my two youngest sons, Jonathan and Tim, um, we have been coming to New Life for about a year and a half. And uh, for the past four years, I've been going through the process of becoming a Pennsylvania certified teacher while teaching um, at a public charter school in North Philadelphia. Um, God kind of moved me into the profession of school teacher um, after 21 years of working in church ministry. So I was um, youth minister, music minister, variations of those two things put together or separately in, in several churches. And eventually, um, I, I pastored um, a few churches. Um, and um, I did this, you know, I, I pastored while I was in seminary and, uh, and then afterwards. But you might be wondering why someone would move from um, being a pastor to teaching seventh grade English. <laughs> That's a, that's a big question, and I still ask myself that often, um, usually on Monday mornings. But um, there are many reasons and many factors that led to my change in occupation. And I wish I could say that it was for noble causes. I wish I could say that it was for selfless reasons. But the truth is that um, I had several idols in my life, um, things that I um, was worshiping that were not God. Um, one of those things uh, was ministry, actually. Um, I allowed ministry to become an idol in my life. Um, at the same time, um, I was holding on to um, and hiding um, other sins in my life, things that were displeasing to God, things that um, were um, against my relationship with my wife and, um, and that put me in a position of not being someone who um, was, was being the father that I should be and someone who shouldn't be in ministry. Um, this didn't come to light, however, um, until about nine months ago. But these sins were holding me captive. But God in His, in his mercy continued to draw me to Himself um, he continued to soften my heart that was becoming calloused. Uh, he continued to open my eyes to the reality uh, of his immense love for me, 
even though I was in a state of rebellion, even though I was trying to pursue him, but also pursue other things. Um, God showed me how much that he loved me, even though I was still acting like an orphan child. And God has been doing this work in me since the time that I acknowledged him and accepted his gift of salvation at the age of nine. But like I said, it wasn't until about nine months ago that I really stopped fighting him. And I began uh, to confess my sins to, um, to people, uh, to people that he put in my life who were safe, um, people that I could become accountable to for my actions, for my behavior, for my thoughts. Um, I w began to confess to my wife and, and to my children about the things that were going on that were not pleasing to God. And so God has brought healing uh, into my life. God has restored relationships that I was neglecting. Uh, God has begun to bring healing into my body so that I am beginning to see who I am, um, uh, the way he created me, and what he desires for me to do and to be, how I should think and how I should act. Um, and so this healing that I've experienced has also helped me to see what's going on. It's, it's helped me to stop being so selfish. It's helped me to stop having my eyes on me and what I want and what I think I need and what I want to feel and begin to see what other people need. And some of those people that I'm seeing are my students, these seventh grade middle school students in North Philly um, who, um, who have challenges. They have things that, that they have to overcome. Um, and right now in, the, in our situation, it feels like everything is, is running off the rails. I mean, there's pandemic. Um, we're, we're going to uh, be completely virtual this uh, first report period. So everybody's online, they're at home, I'm at home, um, trying to get set up, trying to make sure that they have all the equipment that they need, make sure that they have internet. Um, and so we're trying to catch our students up on technology to help them navigate the new way of doing school, um, which requires a lot of independence and drive. And then there's the issues that are going on in the world around them and around us. Um, the, the pandemic, the reality of the subsequent actions around systemic racism, fear, uncertainty, uh, instability, and they're 12 and 13, right? And so this is just one, um, one thing that God is bringing to, to light. And I wanted to bring to you um, specifically because and we are focusing on, on education. We are having a prayer meeting after the service. And, and these are some things that you can be praying about, um, things that, that our young people are grappling with, um, isolation, uh, instability, fear, uh, not knowing what's going on around us, all of those things. And, and I believe, because I've experienced God's healing in my life, I know that God can bring healing into their lives as well. And so um, our children need hope. And you and I, we all know where that hope is found. And so having, having, having been humbled and broken, yet loved and placed on the rock of Christ um, is is the only foundation that there is to stand on. So let's pray that, um, that we will continue to humble ourselves and submit ourselves to God and pray that these things will happen to our students. Thank you. Can we pray for you? That was really powerful and honest. Uh, let's pray for John and the students and family. Lord, thank you for our brother and give him 
and his family, the whole Deaton family, every grace in our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Uh, thank you for this, this word that he shared with us. We, we feel just blessed and privileged to hear this uh, for the work you've been doing in his life. Please continue it, Lord. And for the students as he's teaching, uh, bless them. We pray with all that's going on. But thank you for the work you've done in our brother. Uh, and uh, we, are, we are the better for hearing it too today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I think by now a number of you know that we're going to be doing a deep dive into the Lord's Prayer this fall, which I'm looking forward to. But uh, it's, it's a gift that keeps on giving. And just recently, I'm coming to appreciate the, the, the interaction between heaven and earth that is built into the Lord's Prayer. And uh, when you come to Revelation chapter 4, there's a door that is open in which John in this vision is invited to walk through the door and get a picture of what's going on in heaven. And what you find there is worship. And so I want to call us to worship by reading from one portion of, of that uh, account, which is in chapter 5. Would you stand, please, as we uh, get a glimpse of the worship in heaven, which we pray, pray is reflected in our worship here on earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and in all that is in them, saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Let us pray. What an extraordinary thing, O oh Lord, that we... Feeble and uh, inadequate as we are can, can come into your very presence. And with those who are near you in heaven, say, worthy, worthy. Receive, O Lord, our worship this morning. Thou art worthy, O Lamb of God. Thou art worthy, glorious Father. Thou art worthy, Holy Spirit. Will you receive this sacrifice of worship? we bring to you now for the honor and the glory of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And exciting news, you get to sing now. Yay! Progress.
cried out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. You can be seated. Um, as Steve said, we're starting a sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. And I thought, what better way to start a sermon series on the Lord's Prayer than to pray the Lord's Prayer? Um, so you can see it's up on the screen here. And I actually want to take just a couple of minutes for you to read it quietly, um, to start to let the words sink in, in your own heart, in your own life, in your own experience. Um, think about what these things mean for you. And then after a few minutes of silence and reading or praying, if you know it by heart, we'll pray it together aloud. So let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, and your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's continue praying to the Lord together. Lord, we pray uh, as your people that you would enable us to dwell upon this incredible understanding that we can call you our Father. We were created for you, Lord, and we know, everyone knows at some level of their hearts that we will not find our rest until we can find our rest in you. For we were created for you and we live for you. Not only did you create us, Lord, but, but we know from your word that you pursued us when we were rebels. And yet you loved us, loved us all the way to the cross so that, Lord, sinful and broken that we are, we would be reconciled to you so we can call you our Father. We pray this morning that we would rest in the strong and perfect love of a perfect Father who cares for us who gave us the Holy Spirit so that we would not live as orphans, that we would, even in hard times, know that you always and at all times treat us as your sons, your beloved sons and daughters. We pray this, Lord, because we know you to be our Father. You have shown us your heart toward us. 
Lord, I think of what John just spoke about, especially with respect to our children. This is going to be and has been a difficult time for children and for students and for teachers. And so we lift them up to you, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you would give them all the wisdom, the teachers and parents, all the wisdom and skill they need to, to teach our children and to guide them. Lord, we know how the pandemic has isolated many children. We especially know, Lord, that those who have special needs children have borne the brunt of this isolation the most. Mercy on them, Lord. We pray, Lord, that we would be as creative as we can be to help them end this, this, um, this isolation. Uh, and yet we pray even deeper still, Lord, two more things. We pray, Lord, would you grant us the end of this pandemic and treatment for it? And we pray, Lord, even deeper than that, that this turmoil that we have gone through would bring the world to the understanding and recognition that this is not a materialistic world. It is a world overseen and loved by a sovereign God. And so we pray, Lord, that people will come to Christ in large numbers through this. Lord, we also want to pray, as I think about our, our, our country right now, we pray for peace in our cities, for an end to the violence. We pray that true protest and discussion will be understood as the vehicle for change, not violence. So stop the hands, Lord, that both provoke violence and do violence, we pray. We pray that is done well. And Lord, we pray for racial peace in our country, that we would listen to one another and grow in understanding with one another that we would seek reconciliation. And I want to pray, Lord, that your church, even this church, us, me, would actively seek understanding and reconciliation with others grounded in the love of Christ. Lord, I want to pray for those who are grieving the loss of someone they loved. I think of Deb, and Christy and Jason and Rachel and the friends of Rick who passed away a little more than a week ago. Thank you for a worship service on Thursday, Lord, that reminds us again that our faith in Jesus is grounded in the reality of a resurrection. That our longing to live forever is not just wish, wish fulfillment, it is grounded in the truth of Jesus Christ, who himself is the resurrection and the life. So give this family deep comfort from that knowledge. We also pray for Tanya, who continues to grieve the loss of her son uh, and Eli, Lord. Uh, and we pray for him as he grieves the loss of his father. And Lord, I think of all those who even years and years later live with an ache in their heart as they think of their husbands and wives and their mothers and fathers and their grandmothers and grandfathers and their children and their friends. That ache reminds us the cost of love and that ache reminds us there is something ahead for us because of you. Comfort them as well, Lord. And Lord, I want to pray for those who are ill and are most vulnerable right now. I continue to pray for Chris. Lord, it has been now one year since she started chemo. One more year of life. Thank you for being gracious to her and giving her the strength that she needs to pursue this. And now we pray, Lord, that your graciousness, graciousness would also extend to the end and cessation of this cancer for her. We pray this for our dear sister. We pray for Mariah, Lord, who has been behind doors in her assisted living nursing home and who is now in hospice. Mercy on her, Lord. Give her good care. In the depths and spirit of her heart, remind her of your enduring love for her, that she will one day soon see you face to face 
the object of her deepest love, the one she has loved the most. And Lord, right now I want to pray also um, for those serving in the military. So I will name Jess and Phil, John and Tom, Shane, Luke, Natalie, Emma, and Ben. Would you protect them? And would you enable them to serve you with honor and equity and justice? Bring peace to our country as well. And now I pray for Steve, Lord. Thank you that he is here bringing us your word. May we listen to him and his words and hear your words right through him. Encourage our hearts this morning in the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A great introduction to this uh, study is in the brief uh, video clip that uh, Pastor Mark included in the uh, invitation to, to tune in for this Sunday. So many of you may have missed that, but that's a, a great place to check in just to get you oriented toward this uh, study we're going to be doing. So I want to just jump right into the scripture that uh, from which the Lord's Prayer uh, comes uh, both Matthew and then Luke. So please give attention to the Word of God, reading first from Matthew chapter 6, which you should recognize as uh, the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. So that's the setting in which uh, we read these words as Jesus speaks of uh, the spiritual life. So turn, if you will, if you have Bibles, um, the well, we, I say we don't have Bibles in the pews anymore, do we? So I can't give you a page number, but it's Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 5 through verse 15. Let us hear the word of God. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And then turn over to Luke chapter 11. And I want you to, first of all, just be aware that this is a different setting. Some, so often in the, in the Gospels, of course, an incident is repeated. Three writers will tell about the feeding of the 5,000 or the baptism of Jesus. This is a different setting than the one we just read. But here are the words from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, 
When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. This is the word of God. Sandy and I have been uh, in and out of um, New Life for over 20 years now. And I suspect if you've had a chance to hear me teach or preach uh, very often, you're very much aware that I have a particular passion about the Lord's Prayer. Uh, not just for the sake of uh, tradition or liturgy, but this was a transforming experience for me personally. And uh, that's where, really where, where I'd love to, to jump into this and uh, just talk about my own journey in this regard. And uh, it actually began right here in Luke chapter 11. I remember, I, I think, I don't know the date, but I do remember the, the kind of the light bulb moment that I was reading, I suspect perhaps because it was uh, part of a Bible reading schedule or something, but, and you know, you can read scripture a hundred times and all of a sudden it just comes alive and it grips you. And I was reading this uh, passage in Luke chapter four, where the disciples came and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Wham. I mean, I'd been a pastor, frankly, for almost 20 years at this point. It's not that I didn't pray, but I have to tell you, I thought my prayers were so boring. I mean, if I was bored with my prayers, <laughs> what would God think? <laughs> and, and I was stuck. I really didn't know kind of where to go with this. Have you ever felt like that? I mean, uh, we all, I hope, believe in prayer. It's a mystery to me why you pray, but, but we do, and rightly so. But uh, kind of what it's all about, I, I don't know. So, so at this particular moment, this just simply rang true to me. Lord, teach us to pray. And what's the answer? Well, it's still up on the, on the board, and you can look at it. Lo and behold, in some great, profound, mysterious uh, answer, the Lord Jesus gives a variation of what we now call the Lord's Prayer, right? This is his answer. I need help. Lord, I want to have you teach me to pray. And he says, okay, here it is. When you pray, say, Father... Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we forgive those who sin against us, and lead us not into temptation. Five basic petitions when we've called God Father. And I thought, okay. I don't really have anything better to, to work my way out of this problem. Maybe for a change, I'll take Jesus' words at face value. And I, and this is honestly the process. I mean, it probably stretched out over a, a period of time. I don't know, but, but I really thought that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let the Lord's Prayer be an outline. Now, I have another slide which shows really the Luke 4 passage and uh, the Lord's Prayer as we pray it side by side. Uh, and so you just get the sense that, that uh, Jesus is teaching this, I think, on, on many occasions. That's why I pointed out that the Sermon on the Mount is not the same as this Luke uh, 4 setting. And it's not beyond my imagining, therefore, to think every time Jesus would teach about prayer, one of the things he would invariably do is teach the Lord's Prayer, as we call it now, to teach this five basic uh, petitions once we've called God Father. 
And there it is. Father, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There, and there, down each one of those five. And so I started. I said, well, okay. For a little while, I'll try it. I'm just going to let this be my outline for prayer. I don't think it means simply that you have to pray it in a rote sense over and over and over. I mean, that's nothing wrong with that. But I'm going to let this be an outline for my prayers. And actually even touch the fingers of my hand to guide me through this. And this is what I want to kind of briefly teach you this morning. But it's just simply, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Which, by the way, uh, I think means thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Isn't that what the kingdom is all about? And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins and lead us not into temptation. Well, I have to tell you, that was 30 years ago. I thought it would be a temporary fix while I kind of got my prayer life back in order. I can't come up with anything better, to be honest. And the more I focus, the, the kind of the deeper you go. But it's, it's the same basic outline that, that we can all get a hold of. And so to, I want to teach you to, this morning to, to pray the Lord's Prayer, not just to use the words, but to pray it. Uh, simply this, learn it, say it, and pray it. Got that? Now, I suppose it would be easy to say, well, everyone knows the Lord's Prayer. It is indeed uh, the most well-known prayer that I, I suspect has ever been offered. But I don't want to presume that. There may be some of you who really have to say, well, you know, I know it's there. Uh, I've heard of it, but I don't, I don't know the Lord's Prayer. And I, I want to encourage you, first of all, just to learn it. Learn the traditional words. I, I noticed a few minutes ago we prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done, instead of the, these and thy, these and thou. That's, that's kind of indifferent, but, that's, uh, um, but some variation that we all pray together. We say the same words. And just learn it. You mean I'm supposed to just wrote, memorize something? Yeah. And parents, I want to especially say to you, make sure your kids know the Lord's Prayer. Not just as a memory exercise, but deep down in their souls. And when they try to walk away, and we don't assume that's going to happen, but kids have to struggle many times, but they can't get away from the fact that deep down within them is this Lord's Prayer. And even in moments of desperation, they can say, Father, hallowed be your name. So teach it to your kids and help them memorize it. I mean, after all, we teach them the times tables, right? You drill it five times five, and we expect them to come up with that. Six times five, 12 times 12, whatever. And I dare say those of you who didn't master the times tables in your youth have probably had a trouble with mathematics or, or arithmetic for the rest of your life. I'm watching my little great-grandchild. It was fun when we were together at the shore. She's already saying her ABCs. Now, for a little kid, what are ABCs? They're just sounds. But we still teach them A, B, C, D. They learn the alphabet. And then they begin to say, oh... That's what words, that's what makes words. And then they learn to read and on and on. But start with the most basic. So yeah, learn the Lord's Prayer. And then say it. Now Jesus warns us, doesn't he, about just meaningless repetition. 
But isn't it interesting that in the very next sentence, when he says, don't be like the Gentiles, repeating phrases over and over and over, he says, here's how you to pray, and he gives us the Lord's Prayer. So it's certainly not a, a, an inappropriate thing to learn how to say the Lord's Prayer. Say it at home, in your personal prayer, as a family. If I can use just a personal example, after struggling with kind of, uh, Sandy's and my, how to work out our morning, uh, you know, pr prayer life together, here's what, we, here's what we do, and we've done it the last several years. Now, we're retired, you know, our mornings are pretty leisurely, not all of you have the same circumstance, I understand that. But we start our mornings, most mornings, I would love to say we'd never miss, but I can't do that. But after we've uh, had our second cup of coffee, we sit down together and read a passage, typically a scripture passage, or uh, in fact, for a, a while, we used Tim Keller's book on the Psalms. And then after we've read, I will pray, and then she prays, and then we pray together the Lord's Prayer. I don't feel like it's meaningless repetition because we, we have a sense of what's there. Well, I don't know what that'll look like for you or your family, but I'm saying, you know, personally pray it, or say it, rather. And here in, in church, we need to say it. Uh, encourage, obviously it's going to be very much a part of our liturgy as we gather <clears throat> through the fall. But uh, I hope that continues. It doesn't have to be every Sunday, but it's just a regular part of things. And let's remember, folks, one of the most important things we're doing on Sunday mornings is finding ways to let our children have a sense of participation, entering in, not just being spectators. And here's a gift that you can give them, this, the simplest thing in the world. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. And so, yeah, say it. And then the, the third thought is to pray it. So it's not just words that, that we say. And uh, I, I know this is a struggle, in fact, for some of you who grew up in the Roman Catholic tradition. And you learn from the very beginning, the Our Father. It's the same prayer. It's just a different way to say it. And, and I've had conversations with folks coming out of that background who have come to a, a deep personal faith. And one of the first things they do is sort of throw out everything that they learned growing up. And I want to say, don't do that. You've been given a gift if the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, is deep on your soul. But don't just say it, but pray it. And let me walk you through that briefly. And every one of these are, is just going to scream out to say more. But uh, again, I have a simple way that I've been uh, using to explain this, which I'll show you up on a slide and that's simply the hand. What's beautiful, by the way, is that even illiterate people, people who, who don't have a computer to lug around or textbooks or workbooks or whatever, all you need is a hand. Uh, some years ago when I was part of Surge, we know it was then called World Harvest Mission, uh, Sandy and I were living in uh, London for a brief time, and Bob Heppy invited me uh, to come and preach on a Sunday morning, and guess what I preached on, uh, among other topics in different times. But I gave this basic lesson on the Lord's Prayer. Masigar, the church there, many of you had the privilege to go there, is made up of people from uh, Muslim and Hindu and Sikh backgrounds, um, many of them not yet really followers of Jesus. Uh, and uh, I, I taught the Lord's Prayer, ticking off those five petitions. And I said, this is something you can learn. And then the next day or two, I was asked to come and, and say some words to the team as they had gathered. And uh, so I talked about how to use uh, the Lord's Prayer as just like the first lesson of discipling new believers. And so I'm holding up my hands going through the, the five petitions. And Rick Buttemeyer, whom we still support at the time, Rick was part of that team, interrupted me and said, hey, Steve, why not talk about our father as the palm of the hand? 
Well, why not? <laughs> this has sort of come together with the, with the suggestions of many different, different people, but isn't it obvious that everything we say to God, just like the palm connects everything in your hand, everything we say to God grows out of calling him what? Father. Don't just sort of skate by that. You know, in a way, because Jesus spoke so often of the Father, we, we almost take that for granted. But, oh, friends. Well, in fact, as I began to get more into the, to the Lord's Prayer, I stopped and I did a little study on how God is addressed in the Old Testament. And there are times that refer to God as Father, but go back and check it for yourself. And you can talk about Abraham and Moses and David and the holy men and the priests and the prophets. Do you know, do you know how many times God is actually spoken to as father, that he's addressed that way in the Old Testament? Not once. Not once. No one would it think of actually speaking to the almighty God, creator in the end of the ends of the earth and saying to him, Father. Until the coming of Jesus. And so when we are invited to say our father, who's inviting us to pray that way? It's Jesus. You know, we, we typically put at the end of our prayers in Jesus' name, which is totally appropriate. But the fact is, it's not at the, it's at the end of our prayers. It, it's the very essence of the prayer itself. That when we say our Father, we're praying the way Jesus prayed. We call God by the very name Jesus did. So as you, as you start to pray through the Lord's Prayer and you say, Our Father, who art in heaven, stop and, and reflect what you're doing. In some ways, I suspect you could say, if you put in some kind of rank order, this is the single most important part of the prayer itself, just the way we speak to God. And we can go farther, can't we? We can actually call him Abba, Father. And that's where it starts. And the very first thing that we pray when we begin through the petitions is to say what? Hallowed be thy name. Now, sometimes I've heard people say that, that's, you know, Lord, you are holy. Well, that's true, but that's not the point. The point is not a statement about God. It's a petition. May your name be hallowed. May your name be honored. May you receive the reverence that is due your name. And so we begin this prayer that Jesus gave us with worship. That's what worship is. Worthy. Worthyship. Worthship. Lord, you are worthy to receive praise and honor and glory. And I'll confess to you, if you ask my own instincts about prayer, when I think of prayer, I think of telling God all of my problems. That's what prayer is. And we can't wait. We sort of push everything else out of the way to talk about our problems and our burdens and our needs. And that's going to come. But if you discipline yourself to pray as Jesus taught us, you will first say, hallowed be your name. And let sort of that fill in with, with offering to God our worship. And then we pray, thy kingdom come. And uh, as I said a few minutes ago, I, as I wrestled with what it meant to pray for the kingdom to come, I <clears throat> began to realize that 
that really the very next phrase in the Lord's Prayer, which interestingly is, is not part of the, the Luke a shorter version, thy will be done on earth as it is already done in heaven is really the essence of what, what the kingdom is, what we pray for. That the kingdom has come in the person of Jesus. We enter the kingdom through the new birth. We pray for the spread of the kingdom through the preaching of the gospel. And we pray for this earth to somehow reflect the peace and unity and harmony that there is in heaven. Where the tribes and nations and peoples of every language and tongue gather around the throne to offer worship to Jesus. Oh, we'll never see that perfectly on earth until the kingdom comes in its fullness. But we pray that we would have some taste of that, some kind of sense of peace and justice on this earth, even as already there perfectly in heaven. And friends, I, I just have to say, because we're all just torn apart by what's happening in our country. Nick prayed for it appropriate. Mark, in his comments, said, this is, this is where we need to sort of start. This is where we keep our center. And indeed, friends, we do not have an agenda that's dictated by this world, whether it's uh, Black Lives Matter or Donald Trump or the Republicans or the Democrats, and we feel ourselves pulled one way, another, another, another. We have God's agenda, honestly. And we pray thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I, I well, again... This just kind of can explode with me. I, I can't describe to you how significant learning to pray about the kingdom coming has transformed my own view of ministry, my own personal life. Uh, it's, it's just huge. And so I encourage you to, again, pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and kind of let that begin to filter through your whole view of life. But then you notice the, the prayer changes from what you, we'd say the second person, thy glory, thy kingdom. And now it says, give us, right? It's the first person. So there is a place indeed to come with our needs and our burdens, which is first of all, what? Give us this day, what? Our daily bread. I've, I've heard people try to spiritualize that and uh, speak about, you know, spiritual bread. No, it's simply our day-to-day -day needs, our food, our health, our shelter, our work, the burdens that we carry about those kind of day-to-day -day needs. God wants to hear those. Bring those requests. He loves to hear your needs and your concerns. Pray over that. And pray that for your neighbor as well. All this is in the plural, isn't it? Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. Some of you learned it as forgive us our trespasses, but I'm sure you see it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's prayer for the forgiveness of sin. And all too often I hear people sort of begin their prayers with telling God what a wretch we are, what a, what a mess. How, Lord, forgive us our sins. People have said, how can you come into God unless your heart is cleansed? So first of all, you have to confess your sin. Well, I have to say, who are we kidding? That we can tick off a few things we've done wrong and say we've confessed all our sins. Dear Jack Miller would say what? Cheer up. <laughs> You're worse than you think. We don't know the half of it. And so it is a, an ongoing thing, not to beat ourselves up, but to honestly say to God, forgive us our debts, forgive us our sins. But the proviso that Jesus himself commented on in, in, in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, forgive us our debts, how? As we forgive our debtors. 
And I wondered as I thought about that, see, if maybe the most important part of, the, of that petition is not simply the forgiveness of sins, because we do confess our sins in an ongoing sense, but a, a time to stop and see who we've sinned against, where we need to build new relationships and seek reconciliation, and at the very least have a forgiveness in our heart to our those who've sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation. We pray finally. It, it, to me, that's the sense that we, we now begin to focus uh, on kind of what's in, what's in front of us, where we're going. Dear J.I. Packer, the wonderful teacher who died very recently, I remember reading him say, life is a minefield. And we're going to step out into that minefield. And so we pray, lead us not into temptation or trial, but deliver us, O Lord, from evil. And that literally is translated from the evil and is often translated as from the evil one. And so the whole question of putting on spiritual armor that's talked about in Scripture comes up here. And we pray that for ourselves, but, but this is really a, so appropriate to pray this for our children as they walk out the door, as they leave home, to pray this for friends and neighbors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Are you beginning to get just a, a little taste of how much is here? I dare say virtually everything that you would want to pray about comes under one of those five categories, all built on the privilege of calling God Father. I have, in fact, kind of an expanded version of praying the Lord's Prayer that you are welcome to get a hold of. It's going to be, uh, I think, Mark, you said you're posting it on the church website. It's, it's, he, he put it also on the, on the notice that he sent out about church this morning in your email. But write me if you want it or uh, uh, whatever. But I hope you'll take advantage of that. But that's, if you say, I'm going to not just take a few minutes, which we're going to do as we close our time this morning, but... Uh, I want to take half an hour. I want to take an hour to pray through the Lord's Prayer. And even then, you're just beginning. But have you, have you dedicated an hour to prayer? Well, here's a way you can do that. And just dwell guided, guided through to meet the presence of God. Wow. What can we say? But for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's, that's not part of the prayer that Jesus taught, but it is so ancient that no one quite knows where it got attached to the Lord's Prayer. And so it's totally, and it's totally consistent and proper. It's a doxology. I mean, we're overwhelmed when we come into the very presence and call God Father. And so we have to say those words, praise God, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And we add, amen. That's an ancient word that simply says, yes, Lord, I agree. In fact, when, any, when anyone prays, by the way, you, sh you should say the amen, not the person praying. You should say, I hear this, I agree, I enter in. Amen. amen. So for just a few minutes, a couple of minutes, really, <clears throat> I want to close our time by letting you pray through the Lord's Prayer. I'll guide you. That is to say, I'll say the phrase and then, and then concentrate your prayers on that very thing. Don't kind of let your mind jump all over the place, but, but just dwell on Father or whatever. Uh, this, is, this is what I hope will be helpful to you as a practical matter. And uh, kind of... If, if you're not stuck, if you're fine with kind of how you're, the pattern of your prayer, I don't want to interrupt that. I want us all to have a rich and wonderful life before the Father who is in heaven. So let me guide you and let's pray together. Let's pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You all can stand up um, as we prepare to worship. Um, the inspiration for these songs was Hallowed Be Your Name this morning. So we're preparing to say to God, you are worthy of my praise. Therefore, I will give it no matter what the circumstances are. So sing, clap, dance, move, bop, whatever you do. Praise the Lord because he's worthy. So let's sing together. We 
song in the sanctuary. We sing our song to give you the glory. We sing our song to give you the praise. And we will praise you for the rest of our days. Yes, we will praise you for the rest of our days. to the Lord, to God our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. Our God is a God who saves. The Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit guarantees our hope until redemption's done. Until we join in endless praise to God the three in one. To the praise of your glory, to the praise of your mercy and grace. This is what the Lord God says. He who created the heavens, turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. May our homes be filled with dancing. streets be filled with joy. May injustice by 
out of Jesus. As the people turn and pray, Blessings this, this morning comes from Romans chapter 15. Receive God's grace and mercy as you go forth. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Go in peace. Amen.